Welcome to A Thousand and One Ways to Cope with Stress. I am Professor Kinshasa Shabaka, and we are pleased to have Dr. Frederick Manderson talking with us today about the Hatshepsut Temple in Egypt at Dal Dar el Bahari. Dr. Manderson. Yes, thank you. Good morning and thank you for having me. Uh, as you indicated, the title of our uh, presentation today is called Hatshepsut's Temple at Dar el Bahari. The first thing that we need to ask ourselves is who was Hatshepsut? And we will find that we are dealing with a remarkable woman, uh, very astute, some may say wily, but very calculated. You have to understand that uh, she rose to power in a male-dominated world, and she faced stiff opposition. So she had to be very smart uh, and think in terms of alliances so that she could maintain her position against this s stiff male competition. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, she came to power uh, for because her father, Thutmosis I, had chosen her over her brother that she ultimately married and have a child with because he was sickly, but he didn't have the forcefulness to rule. Hmm. So what Thutmosis did is he called together the princes of the realm and advised them, this is my daughter, and I want her to succeed me. And those of you who will support her will have good fortunes. But those of you who speak in blasphemy against her or plot against her, your end is predicted. He did advise her, however, to make alliances with strong males in the kingdom. So here she is now. You've heard the story. Well, I had seven or eight brothers, uh, which is a modern parlor. Mm -hmm. So she is uh, the daughter of um, uh, Thutmosis I. She marries Thutmosis II. The potential heir to the throne that she occupies was to be filled by Thutmosis III. She aligned herself with significant male figures in the kingdom of whom Senmut was the most significant. He ended up holding something like 40 different titles, so he was considered the most powerful man in the kingdom. She con conceived of a strategy in which to legitimize her right to rule by saying that, in fact, the god Amun had visited her mother in a flash of light and perfume and conceived of her. And this is what she indicated at her temple. So now she is in the midst of males, a single female. Well, you know, she had to... Uh, play her cards right. <laughs> so this is the person that we are encountering. So we're dealing with this mm -hmm. shrewd and wily woman who was not opposed to making decisions that undercut others, but put herself in the most prominent position. But most significant of all, she emphasized her role as the son, not the daughter. Well, it, it depends on the situation. Oftentimes, she would be considered the son of the god mm -hmm. or the daughter of the god, according to how she played the, 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 her, her cards mm -hmm. at a particular time. So in order to, to, to bring this into full realization, she ended up building tremendously in favor of the god, as well as social projects that benefited the people, as well as herself. So now, in this... We are, we are told that texts and images were uh, construed to show that she was the physical offspring of Amun-Ra mm -hmm. and that, she, that her father appointed her as his heir, Thutmose I, 
and that she was doing things to show that, in fact, she was worthy of rule. You have to understand that she is considered an uh, uh, interloper at a time when only men could actually sit on the throne of Geb, who was the earth god. Mm -hmm. So though she seized power from Thutmosis the the third, she did not choose to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, she kept him around, and oftentimes she would be seen in company with him either conducting the ritual or uh, even doing things that, quote-unquote, a couple would probably have done, even though he was really the co-regent. But she wielded the power. Mm -hmm. Because, first of all, he was a minor at the time that she seized control, and secondly, because uh, she had the powerful males who... Uh, 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 she had the powerful... Um, uh, males who uh, had significant influence in the kingdom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, evidence shows that both she and him were celebrating a said festival, and a said festival is a, is a ceremony of rejuvenation similar to a coronation, but uh, it is generally done every 30 years, uh, the first 30 years for, for sure, uh, then after that, the, the king uh, may choose to do another one, but it's an individual thing, but she's shown doing it with him, which, uh, you know, I want to keep you around, but do I'm the power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, in many places, uh, we see that she used him to legitimize her role on the throne, because if you got rid of him, it would you you would have in our parlance say face charges, but by keeping him uh, in the back room, she could still wield her influence. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we see as many as possible. We see in the temple in Medinet Habu, they're together. Uh, at, uh, in the red chapel, which she built, which um, replaced her father's sanctuary at Karnak, they're together. In the temple of Dar al-Bari, they're together. At uh, the Spios Artemidos at uh, Beni Hassan, they're shown together. In the temple that they built in, nu in Nubia at Buhen, they're together. Several other places. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this lady, um, uh, Vanessa Davis, writing about how she used his name, she says that the number of scenes examined total 94, of which 72 depict the figure of Thutmose III, and the remaining 22 refer to him in text. Uh, many of the scenes portraying or referring to Tutmos are found in Deir Bari. There were 37 of them together in Deir Bari. There were 26 in the Red Chapel, 15 in Medin and Habu, uh, and Spios Artemis, uh, um, Buhen, and so forth. There were mm -hmm. 16. Mm -hmm. So, in fact, then, uh, she was wily, as I said. We recognize that she was physically the daughter of uh, of. Thutmose the first, even though she claimed, disclaimed that he wasn't really her father, it was the god Amun. Mm -hmm. William Bratton thinks of her as the first great woman of history. We know that um, the, the, the king had principally five names. The, the Horus name, which is uh, as the successor to Horus, who was the son of Osiris and Isis. The, um, the, the Nepti name, which is represented by two goddesses, the goddess of the north and the goddess of the south. The golden Horus, because the king, uh, in all his glory, represented gold that was shiny but everlasting. Mm -hmm. uh, the the, um, the Sutanbat name, which is the name he used as the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. And then the son of Ra name, which was the name, the son of the god. And the fourth and fifth name, the Sutanbat and the son of Ra names, are the names that we see in the cartouches. Okay. So now, she uh, often liked to refer to herself as um, foremost among noble women. So she's like at the pinnacle of everybody. Okay. She was very... Um, Self-opinionated, <laughs> um, she she's often called the female Horus or the perfect goddess, mm -hmm. or sometimes the daughter of Ra. Mm -hmm. um, 
it was interesting, I just said that she was self-opinionated. She, most people had a single car, which is a spirit, uh, a force within. She claimed to have 12. Ra, the sun god, had 14. But even a greater megalomaniac like Ramses the the second, he said, I had 30 cars. Mm. So uh, <laughs> this sort of like sketches some idea of who she was, right? But what did she do? First of all, she did extensive building and repairs to de legitimize herself in the eyes of the people. The 17th dynasty, coming from uh, Nubia, according to Flinders Petrie, held these at its capital. The 17th and the 18th dynasty were fused because, uh, actually should be fused, but they were different because the 17th dynasty expelled the Hyksos and the 18th dynasty ushered in a new era. But out of that 17th dynasty came Amit. Ames Nefertari, which was the black goddess of Ethiopian extraction, and she's shown pictures. So Hatshepsut would have been the most legitimate uh, uh, progeny of this great grandmother, this black pharaoh. So when she was challenged, and it's interesting because I focused in on, in the Red Chapel, uh, one of the images of this woman. And she is purely of African Ethiopian extraction. Uh, we've heard it said that, oh, well, Hatshepsut was not really a very beautiful woman. That beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. But she did have the African characteristics, which was also uh, appended to uh, her great grandmother, Ames Nefertari, who is considered the ancestress of the 18th dynasty. Mm -hmm. So, what do we know about uh, Hatshepsut per se? Okay, so we know that, first of all, she built the Red Chapel, and the Red Chapel, which was built at Karnak, replaced her father's sanctuary as the, whole, the, the, the residence of Holy of Holies where the God resided. In addition, her mortuary temple, she built a mortuary temple on uh, Adira Bari, which is today's subject of discussion, uh, across the river. There's a set of apartments just beside the sanctuary at Karnak Temple where uh, we are see she is shown being baptized by Horus and Thoth, uh, like all uh, kings who entered the temple had to be baptized. The temple had to be baptized before things can get going. You see, the temple is, w was not just a cold building that uh, you entered. It had to come alive before the ritual and the practices can be can be and initiated. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So uh, right there, she's also shown in front of um, uh, uh, Amun as Min. That is the the, the black image of Amun. Uh, he's called thought to be the god of fertility and so forth. She built the kiosk of to the Theban triad at Luxor Temple. Uh, that was latest uh, appropriated by Thutmosis and then again also by Ramses II when he expanded that temple. She repaired a small temple at a place called Spios Artemidios at Ben Hassan. She built a small temple at, um, uh, she was very active, that, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Uh, she, she, interestingly enough, as a young princess, she built a temple, she built a tomb in the Valley of the Queens. There was separation of, of, of internment. So we had the Valley of the Kings, the Valley of the Queens, the Valley of the Nobles, and the Valley of the Artisans, the people who built the tombs. So she built a tomb in the Valley of the Queens. But when she became king, when she seized power, she, she said, well, I'm the son of the God. I'm a king. So uh, she built a tomb in the Valley of the Kings, and this would be one of the, one of the, the, the indictments against her because, I mean, who are you, you know? Uh, uh, and it's interesting because there was a, a the the artists they often take uh, sometimes take uh, how I say uh, license yeah license mm -hmm. with uh, <laughs> with the representation right, you know right. so uh, uh, and the 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 people were in state of confusion how do we address the king mm -hmm. how do we address the queen so uh, often they would say. 
Her Majesty himself. <laughs> so she was both male and female. So now uh, one of these guys taking license illustrated in caricature an image of a couple having sex. And uh, the, the intent was to show that the king was having the business done to him, you know, because he, his queen really is king, and he's having... So, so uh, she's loving herself, right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, um, and so forth. So now we have... Um, uh, <laughs> this gives us some idea of uh, the type of person that we're dealing right, with. Right. But well. the most significant thing is what she did for her final internment, which is to build this temple. Uh, and um, the temple itself in building, being built created additional problems for her because when we fast forward to the 19th dynasty, there's a temple at uh, to Abido, at Abydos to the god um, Osiris that Seti the first built. Mm -hmm. And um, one, of the, the, one of the indictments against her is that she built a temple at Deir el-Bari that was greater than her ancestor, uh, mm -hmm. Montuhote II, who had ruled in the Middle Kingdom. Mm -hmm. So there are these two temples right next to each other. And his temple was an inspiration for her temple, even though... Her temple was more picturesque, it was larger, it had um, uh, more of um, uh, more gods who worship in it, and so mm -hmm. forth. So that was one of the things that uh, came against her. In addition to the fact that she wore male clothing, she went around, you know, I'm a man, so I, you know, uh, I don't think she was very full-breasted chest mm -hmm. or whatever you would mm -hmm. call it. Mm -hmm. So she would wear the traditional male attire mm -hmm. with nothing above the waist and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, she wore a beard. They said, well, you know, uh, the king has to have a beard. So she got a beard like a, um, like a necklace and hung it over her, her, um, her, her shoulder, her, her, her chest. Uh, uh, um, she, um, she changed her name from the female equivalent, which was Hatshepsut II, to the male equivalent, which is Hatshepsut. And then, um, you know, she did, uh, uh, she ruled. Mm -hmm. But she initiated a, a number of innovative cultural practices that became standard that everybody followed for the duration of the time mm -hmm. that um, uh, dynastic rule lasted. How long did her dynasty? She end? she ruled for about twenty years, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's generally shown that um, uh, she did she wasn't removed. Mm -hmm. She died of old age, at a young age, maybe fifties or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, he she didn't die of violence, even though Tutmosis despised her. Mm -hmm. uh, he erased her name wherever it could be found. In most places, there are still evidences of it. Her image is still showed, especially in the temple and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, the two, she erected two obelisks at L Chronic Temple that her her architect Senmut had quarried at Aswan and uh, brought it down river on these flat bottom boats and erected there. And what he did, um, uh, he he walled her temple. Mm -hmm. With uh, he walled her temple with uh, to shade it from to from the public view, and it's interesting because when Amenhotep the fourth came to power and he attacked Amun, because his god's name was Aten and Amun was the the traditional god, by the obelisk being within the wall that he had created, it was protected. So unintentionally, he helped to perpetuate her name rather than, okay, the, the, the obelisk that she erected at Karnak, there were actually four. Two have been disappeared. We don't know what happened to it. But one lies beside the sacred lake having fallen, and the one that stands, uh, stands near her father's, because the father also erected two, we mentioned this in the earlier part mm -hmm, of, the, mm -hmm. of our um, Karnak series. Um, that obelisk is the tallest one standing today. There are actually three of them standing of significance, one at uh, Heliopolis and um, the Fathers. But her obelisk is 107 feet high. 
the, what, there's an obelisk in, uh, called the Lateran Obelisk in Rome that Tutmosis III built, which was 85 feet. And back at Aswan, there is what is called the Unfinished Obelisk. And that was 137 feet, which is almost twice uh, uh, Tutmosis. It was found to have a crack a fit in the fissure, so they never really brought it. Mm -hmm. But you've got to imagine the engineering feat that went into creating a, a, a boat to carry that, to carry that mm. down river a couple hundred miles and then um, have it erected, uh, decorated, and so forth. So mm. on. Okay, so that brings us mm -hmm. to then to um, her temple, per se. Okay, so the temple is the mortuary temple uh, where she would wa was worshipped while alive, and she would be worshipped as a, as a, as a god when when she passed on. Uh, from that temple, which was built with the mountain as a backdrop, and therefore she needed to have uh, come some, come up with some kind of creative strategy in which the uh, as has been said, uh, she didn't want her structure to be conceived as a dog barking against an elephant. Mm, so they, they, instead of height, mm -hmm. they use lines and uh, architectural detail, nicety mm. of architectural detail as you entered into the temple. However, because the Valley of the Kings was on the other side of the mountain, she intended to build a tunnel so that instead of being taken out of the uh, out of the the temple, around the mountain into the valley of king to be to be interred, she hoped to be buried, to be uh, that the tunnel would take her directly to the tomb. But uh, the en engineering capabilities was there, but the ground under the mountain was not s firm enough to support such a venture. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, it was. Um, um, abundant. Mm -hmm. Now, she sent uh, uh, this, what, what was described as the first anthropological study, an expedition to Punt, which is today considered to be uh, in the Ethiopian uh, Somalia area, mm -hmm. to bring back exotic products and incense trees. They brought back 27 incense trees that were, po that were planted in the temple and also at Karnak. Uh, uh, because incense is used as, as a part of the religious ceremony. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, where, how the, 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 the temple was located, now there would be a valley temple at the river's edge where when the visiting you would first embark, disembark in mm -hmm. there, and there would be uh, a, an avenue of sphinxes leading to the entrance pylon. These avenue of sphinxes were, were fronted these incense trees that were that, that were planted along the way, which brings us to the to the entrance pylon, where evidence today indicates two of the trees where they were planted. There, there are signs left there. So the temple is uh, three stories high. It has two courts: a low court and a middle court. It has three levels of of, of colonnades and an upper platform. In the first level. To the left is what is called the mythological uh, colonnade, indicating that there were plants and animals and fishes in a pond or what have you. Mm -hmm. To the right is what is called the uh, punt colonnade, showing how the the, um, the obelisks were transported from Aswan. The middle colonnade had two two um, uh, a shrine to Hathor and a shrine to um, Anubis on the upper platform where the, so, the, where the um, Holy of Holies sanctuary was located mm -hmm. in an upper court and the Holy of Holies was dug into the, into the, temp, into the mountain. Mm -hmm. To the left there would be, uh, there was a chapel for to her father to be worshipped and herself. To the right there was another chapel where the sun god was worshipped in, uh, in an altar at, on an altar that remained in situ or in, in its original position, undamaged, 
and so forth and so on. So here we have this woman now who seized power, ruled for two, th for, for two decades, and um, uh, left this enormously uh, architectural masterpiece. The question that Dr. Ben Johanan has asked is, how come this beautiful temple, 3,500 years later, is just as magnificent? How come it was never uh, considered to be one of the ancient wonders of the world? And his conclusion is that because it was a woman, a temple built for a woman, who ruled, seized power, and held power for two decades. So therefore, she was discriminated back then, uh, despite the mm. fact that in that society, women had equality with men. Uh, many of the queens are shown with, besides their husbands, on the throne, not behind the throne. So uh, this then brings us to the question about who this woman was and why uh, we remember her and why so many modern women want to be like the first queen. So here we have Absolutely. the hatchet. Well, we thank you so much, Dr. Manchester, again, for an exceptional presentation. And we hope that you, our audience, has enjoyed A Thousand and One Ways to Cope with Stress. I'm Professor Kinshasa Shabaka, and this is Dr. Frederick Manderson. Thank you very thank much you. for having me. Until next time.